I've heard you say that uh, the view of a Richard Dawkins that the universe is very reductionistic or a Daniel Dennett that it's just material is inadequate as a view of reality. Why so? <laughs> well, any scientist will take a reductionist argument because that's the way we do our work and any scientist will assume that the material agencies you see around you are sufficient for their explanation, of course. Where I'm uncertain whether that will explain everything is most particularly in the central question of consciousness. Now, again, a materialist I think would say, well yes, it's just sort of the way, as I think Darwin said, the liver secretes bile, in a manner of speaking, and so the brain secretes mind. But the philosophical traditions are very different from that, and I think the great majority of philosophers, let us not exaggerate, some philosophers, would be reluctant to equate mind and matter. And I myself am not persuaded, because the curious thing now is that we actually know an enormous amount of the evolution of sensory systems and their convergences. We know an enormous amount about the way, in a sense, the brain operates. We know a vast amount about intimate relationships, in fact, between our immune system and our brain, which are very fascinating. But I don't think we are a whit closer to understanding how it is we actually do our thinking. And that, to me, suggests that, again, not to try and speak, nor to speak mysteriously. I don't think this is you know, sort of fuzzy new age stuff. What I think is that we may require a science which when it does in some way tackle with consciousness, it may be a rather unfamiliar sort of science. We will build on what we have, and Darwin, of course, was central to that enterprise, but sometimes science takes you to a certain place, and then it is of no use beyond that. Do you, as a Christian believer and a Cambridge professor in the sciences, find it difficult to work with both of those things side by side? Well, I don't personally. No doubt some of my colleagues do. In a way, what I see is that there's a lot in common between the theology and the science. First of all, of course, I think the universe is created out of nothing, creatio ex nihilo. Correspondingly, I think that the world is organized in a rational fashion. But I think you have to be extremely careful not to use any of that as a proof of God. God, apart from anything else, so far as I don't understand him, is other, completely other. But there are at least consistencies in the terms of how the world is organised. Physics and chemistry are pretty comfortable with that, and such things as fine-tuning, for example. Again, do not use a theological argument, but you can at least say it is curious that our universe is organised in such a fashion. We have the curiosity that we're alive, which we take for granted. We don't really understand, first of all, what life is. We recognise it straight away, but we don't understand a very strange sort of metastable jelly, if you like. And also, of course, most astonishingly, some parts of that life have become self-aware and can reflect on themselves and so forth. And that can then be used to say, well, remind ourselves that I think without exception, all human societies are religious. That is, that you know, the sense not only of dealing with, dare I say, the commonplace, death, bereavement, birth, rites of passage, those sorts of things, extremely important, but more especially just a sense of the other, the sense of the numinous, the sense that there are places in the world which are genuinely holy. Now, a materialist would regard these as aberrations, but to many people, I think, they're not simply mistakes of a misfiring brain. I think they actually articulate deeper realities. What would you say to the person who doesn't even want to have a look at Christianity because they think science has painted God out of the picture? Well, they're entitled to that view, and, and they may be right. One's got to remember that it may yet turn out that Scientific investigations lead to things which, in a sense, I'm not sure could they ever prove, but make the likelihood of God so fantastically improbable, and some, I believe, materialists have already arrived at that conclusion. Uh, so far as Christianity is specifically concerned, um, it does crucially, so to speak, depend on historical evidence. And again, you can say, well, these are writings 2,000 years ago by people that we never met, and we have reason to believe that those texts might have been corrupted, changed, altered, and all the rest of it. But I believe that there are sufficient consistencies, and particularly so far as Christian uh, revelation is concerned, the reality, and I regard it as a reality, of the resurrection, which, again, from any normal perspective, including those people who visited the empty tomb, was just, well, I wouldn't say barkingly mad, but so stunningly unexpected that in its own sort of way, I think, well, anybody who could invent that is, you know, either has an imagination beyond one we've ever come across, or, in fact, in the consistencies which I identify on the basis of other people's genius of interpretation is a consistency which I suggest is part of our story. Professor Morris, thank you very much. My pleasure.